It's a craft that few master. A skill that many miss out on. The art of living well. Well, hi everyone. Uh, no matter where in the world you're joining us from today, from the US, from another country, or at one of our, our locations in Northwest Pennsylvania, on a computer screen, in person, on a TV screen, I'm just so glad you're here with us today. We're a church that loves God, we love all people. We wanna see your faith come alive in real life. And so thanks for taking the time to join us today. So trust is an interesting thing. When it comes to relationships, it's a feeling of confidence in another person. That's what it means to trust them. But more than, than a feeling, it's actually a belief that the person will behave in certain ways, certain predictable ways. But I think it's even more fascinating to talk about trust when it comes to money. So the term is used often, like you can set up a trust, you can set up a trust fund. Trust plays a big role in our finances. Now think about it, way back, before there was such a thing as money in the world, uh, people operated on a barter system. Hunter-gatherers had no money. So they gathered and manufactured everything that they owned from meat to medicine, from sandals to seeds. Different groups may have had different specialized goods and so they exchanged items with other groups through an economy of favors and obligations. But the bigger and more complex that groups of people got, the system didn't work as well anymore. And so the larger the number gets, the greater the chance that you might need what the other person has, but they don't need what you're offering in return. And so the system started to break down. And so societies found that the best way to deal with this problem was to develop money. Now, it's pretty wild to think about what money actually is. Like, think about a $100 bill. You could buy a lot of stuff with that $100 bill, but what is the actual $100 bill? It's a piece of colored paper with pictures and a little number at the top. Like, it used to be if you wanted a pair of sandals, you would go to the shoemaker and you would trade him 15 pounds of meat for a pair of sandals or whatever. Now, I go to the store and I hand them a piece of paper that we both agree is worth whatever number is up in that top corner. And even though that little piece of paper is actually worth less than a penny but on its own, and so what gives it its value? Well, Yuval Harari in his book Sapiens said that when money was created, it was simply an intersubjective reality that exists solely in people's shared imagination. It's true. And to prove this, even today, the total amount of money in the world is about $60 trillion. So we all, in our collective imaginations, think that there is $60 trillion that we're dealing with. Yet, the sum total of actual coins and bills and banknotes, like the money that you can hold in your hands, is less than $6 trillion. $60 trillion that we think, $6 trillion in actuality. More than 90% of all our money exists only in our shared imaginations and computer servers. Most business transactions are executed by moving electronic data from one computer file to another without ever exchanging physical cash. And so what's my point here? Well, our whole system of money is not a material reality. It's a psychological construct and it makes you wonder how this system has succeeded this long without total and utter collapse. And do you know how it works? It comes down to one word. The word is trust. Money is simply a system of mutual trust. Why will a little piece of paper with a number in the corner get me a hundred bucks worth of stuff? Why do I believe that this bill is gonna do that? Because my neighbors believe in it. And they believe in it because I do, and the people at the store do, and the leaders of our country do. Money is the most universal system of mutual trust ever devised. So we trust each other that money means what we all agree that it means. And we also, now listen, we also, if we're not careful, start putting our trust in the money itself. And as you just heard, it's a pretty precarious thing to trust your life to. And so we've been going through this series together and we've explored the importance of seeing money rightly and managing it well. And we've talked about debt and budgeting and saving and investing and spending it wisely, all under the umbrella that Jesus came so that we might have an abundant life. And we've discovered that financial struggles are standing in the way for, for so many people, nine out of 10 to be exact. And so today I want to get foundational. I want to share a message with you called Resisting a Leftover Faith. I want to thank my friend, Pastor Dave Ashcraft, for the inspiration for this message and the illustration that I'm going to share with you in just a few moments. But I want to talk today about where are you placing your trust? As we just saw, money can be unreliable. And so here's my big idea. The ultimate question we need to answer is, do I trust God? Our life is a matter of faith. 
You see, ultimately, your relationship with money doesn't just come down to money management. It comes down to, do I trust God? Like with everything, with my money, with my life. When it actually comes to following his plans, do I trust him? And there's not another area of our life that robs us of more peace or causes us more pain than money. Some of you are there today. Maybe you lost a job. Maybe you had a reduction of income. Maybe things have become very financially unstable because of COVID-19. Or maybe there have been some bad choices along the way that, that have just left you in a mess right now. So today I want to look at a story about a woman who's struggling. She understands how you feel. We're going to start off in the Old Testament book of 2 Kings today. And so you can find your way there in your Bible or device. It's closer to the beginning of the Bible than the end if you're using a paper Bible today. But I'm going to read and pull out some principles as we go. And so we're picking up on the story of, of the ministry of the Old Testament prophet of Elisha. And there are many parallels with his ministry and that of his mentor, Elijah. But this story is one of them. And it's important to note here that Elisha is serving God, the true king of Israel. And so we have a bit of a compare and contrast between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. Who will you trust? And so look at 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7. We, we're going to meet a widow here who has run out of money. And here's what it says. It says, Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, but the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And, and so here we meet a woman who is worried because she lost her provider. Her husband died. So she was stressed out financially. The creditors are knocking at her door. And again, some of you can relate. And today, if you're, and today in, our, in our time, if you're unable to pay your debts, you know, the bank can come and repossess your car. It can take your house. In those days, the creditor could come and take your children. Like, what a horrible prospect to face. And so she's out of money because she lost her provider. And she was short on hope because her children were about to be taken. But this woman had to do what we all have to do at some point. And that is, you need to settle the issue of who is your provider. Who do you look to when it comes to your provision? Is it your job? Is it your spouse? Is it your bank, your investments, your credit card company? Is it yourself, your own hard work? I would argue that this woman found out quickly that none of those things are strong enough to be your ultimate provider. Look at verse two. And Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me what you have in the house. And she said, your servant has nothing except the ho in the house except a jar of oil. And so Elisha asks, how can I help you and what do you have to work with? And I think this is such an important exchange for us to linger on for a moment. God does this again and again through the scriptures. When we focus on what we don't have, God focuses on what we do have. Remember when God first called Moses to lead his children out of slavery. Moses hemmed and hawed and he came up with excuse after excuse. And, and God just asked him a simple question. He says, hey, what, what, what's that in your hand? To Moses, it was just a simple shepherd's staff, but with God, it was an instrument for miracles to be performed, which he did again and again. And so Elisha says to the woman, tell me what you have in the house. And he's beginning to, to focus her attention on what she has that God might be able to use. And it's tempting to push this off, to say, well, you know, this isn't a good time right now. My life is in shambles. You know, this woman could have just pushed him off. I don't have anything to give. And some of us can do this too. We can get into this someday mentality. Like, I'll follow God someday, but now's not a good time. Or I'll have faith someday. I'll be generous someday. And when I, when I get out of school, or, or I'll follow you, God, when I get married, or when I get a stable job, or when I hit retirement. When I make all that I need to make, then I'll focus on my faith and generosity. And so the woman is thinking, I'll have time for faith in God someday after I figure out where the money is coming from and are my kids gonna be taken care of. But here's the thing. If God is gonna change your finances, he's gonna start where you are right now. Like he's saying, don't tell me about what you're gonna do someday. Tell me about where you are right now. What do you have to work with? And so she says, I have nothing but a jar of oil. And God says, perfect, we can work with that. Look at verse three. Then he said, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels, and not too few. All right, what a crazy thing to ask her to do. I mean, this is risky. This is vulnerable. He asks her to go door to door through her neighborhood. And, and so what if the neighbors find out what's really happening? What if it exposes her true financial situation? What if they judge me? And by the way, this is one of the questions that causes us to hold back from God more than any other. It's the question of what if. Like, what if it doesn't work out? What if I lose my job? What if I look stupid? 
And we end up not following God because of all the what ifs. But she did it. She demonstrated her trust in God by doing what Elisha asked her to do. She demonstrated the primacy of her faith by stepping into a vulnerable space. It's interesting that often we trust God in the last resort moments when we have nothing left. But in the moments leading up to that, when we actually have something in our hands to hold on to, we'll trust that dumb thing. <laughs> we'll say, I've still got this God. You don't, I don't really need you yet. I've got this thing to put my faith in. And as God shakes his head. And I'll say it again, it's not a matter of money or stuff, it's a matter of trust. Where will you put your faith? Will God get the first of it or will he get the leftovers? And so this woman acts, she steps out, she obeys when it didn't make much sense. And here's the thing, God really responds when we demonstrate our trust in him. He doesn't just want our lips to speak it, he doesn't just want our minds to think it, he doesn't just want our sentiments and our singing. God wants you to demonstrate trust in him through your actions. That's when God responds. And so the widow takes a risk. She goes door to door and she gathers up as many empty jars as possible from all the neighbors. And she's preparing for abundance even though she has nothing. Why? Because her faith is starting to shift. Look at verse four. Elisha says this. It says, then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons and pour into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. And so she went from him and she shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. And, and when the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there's not another. And then the oil stopped flowing. So she came and told the man of God and she said, go sell the oil and pay your debts and you and your sons can live on the rest. And so God did this incredible miracle. All the empty jars get filled to the brim with ex expensive and very marketable oil. And when the jars ran out, the oil stopped flowing. And I'll bet she had wished at that moment she'd gone to a few more neighbors' homes, taking just a slightly bigger risk out there because it seems that the more jars she had gathered, the bigger the outpouring from God. But he opened up the windows of heaven and he filled up all that she had. And she was able to sell the jars and live off the proceeds. Now, we pulled out a few valuable principles from these short verses as we went. We said you need to settle the issue of who's your provider. We said, secondly, if, if God is gonna change your finances, he's gonna start right where you're at right now. And, and third, that God wants you to demonstrate trust in him through your actions. Now, that's this woman's story. But let's talk about our story for a minute. We talk about spending and debt and management and savings, but God says your issues are not really money issues. You're like, no, 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 I'm really struggling with money. And God says, you're actually struggling with, will you trust me? Maybe like the woman in our story, you have financial stress. And like the woman in our story, God says, I'm more than willing to step into your financial situation. And like the woman in our story, he says, all I'm asking from you is that you will demonstrate your trust in me through your obedient actions. And from the front of the Bible to the back, one of the ways that God calls his people to demonstrate trust in him is through generosity. In fact, Jesus would later say that our money has the ability to actually lead our heart into generosity. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, that feels a little funny, doesn't it? We talk a lot about the heart, and we would expect the verse to say, well, what, wherever your heart is, your money will follow. But it actually says the exact opposite. He says, if you demonstrate trust in me with your money, your heart will actually follow along behind. And your heart will begin to trust in me too. Your heart will follow the money trail. Which means if you put some money into fantasy football, guess where your heart is gonna be on Sunday? If you put some money into the stock market, guess what you're gonna be checking all the time? If you spend money on antiques or clothes or furniture or hobbies, your heart will follow. We care about our money, so we care about the things that our money funds. And Jesus' point is that if you want to get your heart to the right place, put your money in the right place. Make your money lead your heart into generosity. And it's why God's idea of percentage giving is so brilliant. Because when I decide to give the first percentage of my income to God, you know what it does? It leads my heart toward the right stuff. It forces me to adjust my kingdom and my lifestyle accordingly. It keeps me from ever giving him leftovers, from kind of tipping God. It keeps me from ever getting to the end of the month and saying, well, let me see how much I have left so I can decide how much I'll give. It ensures that I don't allow everything that comes my way to be consumed by me. Percentage giving allows me to, to be intentionally generous. And it doesn't leave my generosity in the hands of my emotions, which can be unpredictable, amen? <laughs> so, so if I'm left with like, do I feel like giving or not? Or do, did I remember or not? There's no guesswork. 
the question that always comes when I talk about percentage giving was, well, how much are you talking about? And in the Old Testament, God set up a practice in place that would systematically remind people that all they have is his, and a portion of that should go back to him right from the very beginning. And so in the Old Testament, God, God gave Israel the practice of tithing. The word tithe just means tenth. And so God told his people, give one-tenth, 10% of your income back to him. And actually, if you go through the Old Testament and add it all up and, and all the tithes that were required, it was actually north of 30%. But the word tithe means tenth. And so we're going to use that today to illustrate. There's a line in the sand financial principle over in the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. But I don't just want to read it. I want to illustrate it. Watch this. All right, so I want you to see how this works. Proverbs 3, 9, and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. So this is the first fruits principle. This was spoken to, to farmers. And for them, a tithe, it would have meant produce. And so the first 10% of their crops were for God. And so God says, I'm going to give you 10 of these and I want you to give one back to me. And so God gives us 10, and we give him back one. Now, this first fruits principle helps us to remember that it's all his, that, that all we have is on loan. Everything is first a blessing from God. In fact, if you were to die today, very soon, someone else would be driving your car. Someone else would be sleeping in your bed, drinking out of your coffee mug. It doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to me. Everything that we have is on loan from God. And so we give a portion back to lead our heart in generosity and to answer the question, do I trust God? Because all of it is his anyway. And so God says, I'll give you 10 of these, nine of them you can keep for yourself. Like all of this you can keep for yourself. You can save it or sow it back into the ground to get more of it. But I want you to give one of them back to me as a demonstration of your trust. Now remember, giving and generosity is not about money. It's about do you trust God? It's about returning to God what already belongs to God. And did you notice in the passage that, that it came with a promise? He said, honor me with your first fruits. And then he said, and if you obey me in that, then you'll have plenty. I've always just thought of it like a dad, that when a, when a dad sees one of his kids being generous, he wants to reward that kid. And so uh, imagine getting one of those big old bags of candy filled with all the little fun packs, and, and your little kid has a friend over. And, 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 and your kid doesn't know that you have that big bag of fun packs in the cupboard, but, but you just bring out one piece of candy, and you say, will you share this with your friend? And you kind of hide around the corner to watch the inner struggle going on, right? Where your child is, is working through, like, am I willing to give up this piece because it might be the only one I have? I really like candy. Am I willing to share this? But, but they go ahead and offer it to their little friend instead of keeping it for themselves. That's a winning day for a parent. Why? Because it's not about the candy. It's about seeing your child's heart grow in generosity. And little do they know, listen, but after their friend leaves, they have a big old bag of candy in the cupboard. Like there was never any scarcity. You were just expanding their heart. And so God says, I'll give you 10. And I want one back because I'm trying to make a generous heart in you. And a generous heart is far better than a greeting heart. Now, the problem is a lot of people take all that God gives them and they keep it all for themselves. They take everything off this table and they put it on their own table. And there's a story of another group of people in the Old Testament who God had instructed to do this. And they stopped giving back to God like they were instructed. And they were just keeping it all for themselves. Instead of nine for me and one back to you in gratitude, they just went the route that said, all ten for me. And God had some interesting comments for them. So it's in Malachi chapter 3. God makes some really strong statements to the people uh, who, who had stopped doing what he had commanded them to do. And so he says in verse 8, he says, will man rob God? He says, yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In, and he says, in your tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me and, and the whole nation of you. And then, then he says this, he says in verse 10, bring the whole tithe to the storehouse 
that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. I will not, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there's no more need. And so what's God calling out here? He's actually saying, you're, you're robbing me. Like I've asked you to give back a portion to me and you're keeping it all for yourself. And it's not that God needs it. It's, it's that our heart isn't being formed. Our trust in him isn't growing. It's a sure sign that we're trusting in our own strength, our own stuff, our own wisdom. And so people are, you know, taking stuff from, from God's table and they're hogging it and putting it over, over here on their own table. They say, you know, God, I, I know that you said to do all this and to, you said to be generous with this, but, but you don't know my situation. Like I need all of this and I need all of this too. I need every last penny for myself. And then once in a while, you know, maybe I'll, I'll feel guilty and I'll throw a few bucks in the plate or a, a, a hurricane happens somewhere and you Venmo $20 to the Red Cross or whatever. And it's just leftovers. And when we live on a leftover faith, the heart of God will never be formed in, in us. And some will say, well, you know, this is really complicated. I don't know where to start. I don't know how this works. Listen, it's really not that complicated. <laughs> You just figure out your income, you decide what 10% is, and you give it to God. There are a whole bunch of you who are just a decision away from that kind of faith adventure. It's one of the early commitments that my wife Kim and I made when we got married. We said, no matter what, come hell or high water, we're going to give our first 10% to God. And then as we get older, we're going to systematically increase that percentage and give away as much as we can in generosity. And you might say, well, I can't do that kind of percentage right now. I'd have to change a bunch of stuff around. I'd have to eliminate some stuff that I've gotten used to. I'd, I'd have to give up some creature comforts that, to make that happen. Yeah, yep, ex ex yes, exactly. That's the point. You're reordering your heart toward trust and generosity. Now, I also know that there's all kinds of Christians who have come up with all kinds of theological and, and very smart sounding reasons to try to blow this off, to explain away how, how this doesn't apply to us anymore. People will say, well, you know, this, this thing is kind of an Old Testament concept. It doesn't apply in the New Testament. And when they say this, it's usually to justify not giving anything to God. Or, or trying to justify like 1% or 2%. But here's the problem. When Jesus fulfilled the law, he never, ever lowered the bar. He always raised the bar. And so the New Testament teaching is not that 10% of your stuff is God's. The New Testament says 100% is God's. It's all his. This table's his. This table's his. It's all his. And he reminds us that it's on loan to us, but it's all his, which means we can be radically generous with it. And so here at Grace, we encourage a tithe, not as a demand of the law, but, but simply as a, a starting place, kind of a, a marker. Kind of, I, I like to describe it as training wheels that you put on kind of the bike of, of generosity. It's, it's just to get you into the generosity game. And I, think, I can think of no better way to demonstrate trust in God than deciding up front to be generous. And percentage giving, starting with a tithe, is the best way to do that. And check this out. This is the only time that this happens in the whole Bible, but did you notice what God said there in Malachi 3.10? He said, bring the full tithe, not half, not a quarter, not a tip, bring the full tithe to the storehouse. And then he said, put me to the test. He says, test me. Like, try it. Give it a shot and see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour down blessings until there's no more need. He says, I got a full bag of candy in the cupboard for you. He says to the widow, the, the more empty vessels you bring to me, the more I'm going to fill up with oil. So don't be stingy. Like, don't think too small. I, God's saying, I have an unlimited supply. Look at all of this supply. I have an unlimited supply. And I'm just trying to make your heart generous and trusting in me alone. And then he says, and I'll take care of you. And so if you're young, if you're in high school, if you're in college, now is the time to start this. Don't wait. Like a lot of young people say, well, well I'll, I'll start being generous when I make my money or when I'm more wealthy, that's when I'll give. Let me just respond to that and say, you probably won't. 
Like statistics say that you probably won't. The wealthier people get, the less they give percentage-wise. And so start now because your money leads your heart. And as more of your money is invested in kingdom stuff, then more of your heart gets surrounded, surrendered to the king. Now listen, I know how we are. If we're not intentional, like if we don't decide up front, we're gonna do things like this. We're gonna say, well, God, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna need to go out to eat tonight and I don't have a, a lot of money to give to you on top of that and so I, I think you'll understand, God, if I kind of take from this table and, and, and put it over here on my own table. Because, you know, I, I'm, I'm struggling to get by. And, and so I'm going to take from what's yours and, and, and I'm going to go out to eat tonight. And, and, and so we'll rob God. We'll, we'll eat off his table. We'll say things, well, but man, my, my mortgage payment, it's, you know, it's really big. My mortgage payment's a big one. And so I, I just don't have enough over here from what you've given me. And so, God, I think you'll understand, but I've got to take from you. I've got to take off of this table. I, I would be generous, but I've got this mortgage to pay. So I'm going to put this over here. And we'll say things like, oh, yeah, but my, and, and, and I've got these loans from college, and the, the, these loans are bugging me, and I, if I, I, I would really be generous to you, except I've got to pay these loans. And so I realize you've given me all of this over here, but, but, but I need to take from here in order to pay off those loans. And guess what, God? My kids also, they need to go to college, and so they're going to have loans I don't want them to have, and so I'm going to have to take from this over here to, to position my kids better in life. And and God, I've got these bills that I have to pay each month. And I'm sorry, I, again, I think you understand my situation. But, but and sometimes I've got to retire. And so I've got to set some of this aside. And I realize you've given me all of this, but I'm going to take from over here. And what ends up happening, what ends up happening is we come up with all kinds of excuses. And before we know it, we've kept for ourselves what God challenged for us to give. And we'll say, I know you said to give God, but I think, I think I need it more. And so we'll show up to church and we'll tip God. We give God our, our leftovers. And we say, I know you told me to be generous, but this is all I'm left with this month. So this will have to do because I need all of this over here to make my life work. And then we'll turn around and say things like, well, I don't understand why God isn't blessing me or I don't understand why it seems like I'm struggling all the time. And it may be that God is saying to us what he said to those people in Malachi. You're, you're robbing me. And I said, if you would be diligent in your generosity, if you would be diligent in, in, in giving generously, then I will be diligent in opening the windows of heaven and blessing to you. That, that I would blow you away with my abundance, that I would show up in surprising ways and catch you off guard with supernatural provision. But, but look what you're doing here. You're, you're trusting yourself. You, you don't even need me. Do you know what this reveals? It reveals that you're living a leftover faith. So here's my challenge to you. Why not take God at his word? Why not make a decision to give your first fruits, for the first 10% as a starting place of your paycheck back to God in generosity and just see what it does to your heart. And if you're not willing to take that leap, do 5%. Maybe you're at 5% now, go to 8%. Step forward. But here's what I know. Generosity starts with a decision. And then guess what? You have to put a system in place to stick with the decision. This is important of every important thing in life. It's amazing what we're able to do if we schedule it and make it happen exercise, homework, family time, date nights with your spouse. But when it's not scheduled, it gets crowded out. Every gym is filled in January, you know? And if there's you know, non, no ongoing plan in place, if you don't have a workout partner or regular time, you have a very slim chance of still being at the gym in August. If we don't systematize the important things, urgent things are gonna crowd them out. And so if you're a Dave Ramsey fan, go ahead and use the old envelope tool. Like when you get a paycheck, take God's portion off the top, set it aside to give. One of the reasons that we encourage online giving here at Grace, our automatic withdrawal, is so that you can just lock it in. Make sure that generosity to God is a priority in your life. 
There's no forgetting the checkbook. There's no forgetting to give when you're out of town. You're deciding up front, this is the kind of person I want to be. Do I trust God? Do I trust him? Or does the evidence point to, to a lot of trusting myself? I'll keep the next step today very simple. I challenge you to, very simply to make a generosity decision today. And the very best way to do that, I think, is to try percentage giving if you're not already. You're deciding up front. Let your money lead your heart. Stop tipping God and resist a leftover faith and give him the first fruits. And listen, if you're already doing this, take a step up a couple percentage points. And, and for some of you who are rolling your eyes right now and saying, here we go. I knew this was coming sooner or later. Let me reiterate to you what I've been saying this whole series. We want something for you and not from you. I want for you to have a generous heart before God that trusts God over all other things. And I know that intentionally giving away your money is one of the best ways to accomplish that. And so if it feels like I'm a huckster, if it feels like I'm just trying to reach my hand into your pocket, give it to another church. Give it to the city mission or some other Christian organization. That's where all this produce is going, by the way. Because this is about your heart. Test me in this, says God. And see if I won't open the windows of heaven for you and pour out blessing until there's no more need. It's a powerful promise. Give it a shot. I love you guys. And I'd love for you to join us again next weekend when we celebrate all that God has done in our midst during this series.